All right, we're back from our break. Everybody's uh, back here on campus. Uh, how about everyone in Sugarland? Are you all back? We we see two people there. We're here at Cinco. And you're there at Cinco. You're there at Sugarland. Good. Okay. Uh, we're going to go continuing with Viking material culture and looking at food, clothing, uh, housing, and that sort of thing. Um, remember to ask questions. Remember you can interrupt at any time to ask questions. Okay, food. I had a really hard time finding out this information today, but I looked in a lot of different books and I think I found out as much as I could, uh, raised some questions as well. One of the things that really surprised me was that grain was so scarce that bread never became a staple. And we often think of bread as the staple of life throughout Europe, but it's not in Scandinavia. Still to this day, it's really not a staple uh, as much as it is in the rest of Europe. And uh, it, in fact, people used to dream about it. They loved it so much and they couldn't get hold of it because they had such a short growing season, remember, and they had very limited land to cultivate grain on. Flatbread was the preferred form, and flatbread is not exactly like a cracker, but it's, it's pressed flat and it's very, very grainy. Have any of you eaten Scandinavian bread? Yeah, one person has here. Uh, uh, I'll try to bring some next week so you can see what it's like, but it's very grainy. The whole grains are in it, and it, and it, it has a lot of bran, and, and it's, it's quite, um, it's not like refined white flour at all. I mean, they, they hardly ever had refined white flour. Uh, gruel and porridge were the usual form of consumption, and it's interesting, uh, I picked up a new book that I've been reading lately called Food in History that, that traced the use of gruel and porridge. And um, this woman who wrote the book and tracked this back in ancient cultures said that it wasn't like, uh, it isn't like the kind of oatmeal we eat with milk. Rather, they would, they would sort of put water with the grain that had been toasted. They, they toasted or roasted grain mixed with water into a kind of paste that sounds very unappetizing. <laughs> and that's what they call gruel or porridge. Um, and that was very important because it was toasted and it would keep on ocean travel and they could sort of reconstitute it along the way. And also for the elderly who were toothless, the, the gruel would be the main thing that they'd be able to eat. But grain, the most important use of grain was for the brewing of beer. And interestingly, the women were the brewers of the beer. Uh, except in the case when there were no women, if, if uh, for example, when the Vikings went out on an expedition, when they were exploring, or if they were fishing or hunting, and then the men would make the, the beer, but, uh, but, and they would make it on the spot. They didn't have to age it or anything. They would ferment it and drink it right away. Uh, so the beer was the most important of the grain products. Fish were extremely important in the daily diet, and that shouldn't surprise us at all. I mean, they eat huge amounts of fish, and they, they eat more fish than anything else. Uh, it's abundantly available in streams, lakes, and the ocean, and they would preserve it by drying it, and that was called screeth, and it was used year-round, even when they could get fresh fish, they would still eat the dried fish. Uh, when they dried it, it would be hard as a board, and the way they would soften it would be to beat it with a hammer or, or something of the mallet or something like that, and to put butter on it to make it buttered. Uh, herring was pickled in brine and vinegar. Has anybody been to Scandinavia? Uh, when I was in Denmark, um, pickled herring was on every menu in, in various forms with mustard sauce and cream sauce and brine sauce and all kinds. Of, and and um, uh, it, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, what did you all, you, you who've been to Scandinavia, you're shaking your head. Do you like pickled herring? Loved it. Loved it. Oh. I got I, like a sampler platter with like 10 different kinds of herring. It was really weird, but it was good. Oh, great. Well, I went to a smorgasbord, and um, smorgasbord had all kinds of different kinds of herring that I tried. And, and I ate lots of it until I find out, found out it's actually raw. <laughs> 
it's raw and you then and it's just like when you make what is that Mexican dish that um, um, what is the name of it where you, where uh, you ceviche ceviche it's just like ceviche where you, you know you cook the the fish in lime juice for ceviche and and so you cook it in in the vinegar or or something of that sort and um, uh, so anyway it, it's tasty it's very spicy and and uh, I kind of like the mustard sauce myself so that that is a main dish everywhere everywhere you go the other uh, thing that uh, Scandinavia is famous for is lutefisk and um, uh, I don't know if any of you get the New York Times, but there was on Christmas Day there was a huge art uh, article on the wait uh, what was it the first of January I don't know when it was the article was in the New York Times about lutefisk in in Minneapolis and in Minnesota that um, lutefisk is the traditional Christmas dish that everybody eats for a holiday dish. And what it is, is fish preserved in lye. And then you have to, you know, sort of cook it and get the lye out of it. And then you put lots of butter on it. And the, the newspaper article was about how it's fading away with the younger generation in Minnesota. One thing is it smells so bad <laughs> when you cook it. And... Um, I think it probably tastes real bad too. Although, oh no, you does it taste good? What? Tell us. It tastes absolutely horrible. Oh, okay. It sounds like it tastes absolutely horrible. But the older generation in Minnesota is very fond of their lutefisk, and and major restaurants um, specialize in it so that they can they can have it for the holidays, and they cook huge amounts of it. But. This is a Scandinavian delicacy. I didn't try it, and um, maybe I never will. I'm not sure. <laughs> Here are some grains of wheat, which uh, they didn't grow very much, but that was all I had. I didn't have any barley, so I just thought I'd show you the wheat grains of wheat. Uh, so the lutefisk is for special occasions, and, and, and the other major things beside fish is dairy products, milk, cheese, and butter. And this is what they kept their herds for. Uh, they they have uh, um, they wouldn't they didn't eat very much meat because the dairy products were too important. You don't kill your cow because it gives milk. It gives huge amounts of milk, which then you can turn into cheese of various kinds and butter. They would heavily salt the butter, and if you salt that butter, it can be kept for decades. And people would save up the butter and trade with it literally as if it were gold. It was in a medium of exchange, which I spelled wrong. Uh, that's a typo. I know how to spell exchange. <laughs> okay. Uh, butter was, a, and, and, and rich people would just have literally tons of butter. They would be wealthy in butter, and they used it like gold. Also, soft cheeses and curds that would be like cottage cheese or farmer's cheese, which is cheese where the solids separate out from the whey, which is a colorless, clear liquid, very high in protein. And they would save the whey, of course, because they would drink it or they would use it to preserve things in it. And so, uh, and so, uh, dairy products were extremely important. Soft cheeses didn't don't keep for a very long time, so you have to use them right away. But hard cheeses keep forever. And in Iceland, uh, dairy foods enjoyed higher prestige than meat and probably because their animals were so valuable to produce wi uh, wool and cheese, uh, they would make um, cheese from sheep's milk and from goat's milk as well as from cow's milk. And so uh, uh, in Iceland, they even they ate a lot more dairy foods than they did meat. As we said, hard cheeses keep indefinitely, and sheep and cows were more important for their milk and wool than their meat. And I looked everywhere to see if they ate eggs. And, and strangely, I couldn't find any mention of eggs, which are so important in Europe. However, um, when I lived in Santa Barbara, I went to graduate school in Santa Barbara, and I used to go up to Solvang, which was a little bit north of Santa Barbara, and it's a, it's a Danish community, and they would have smorgasbords. And they would always have hard-boiled eggs and deviled eggs and eggs in aspic. aspic. So, 
I suspect they ate a lot of eggs, um, whether or not they're actually mentioned in the sources uh, as one of their dairy products. As for meat, pork was the most important. Why do you think pork would be the most important meat? Why do they eat more pork than anything else? Because you can't make dairy products out of it? Because you can't make dairy products or, or wool out of it. Exactly. That's why. And so when I was in Denmark, and um, just everywhere I went, there was pork. And one of the, one of the major delicacies was pork liver. Like uh, you would think of liverwurst, that kind of thing, would be the, uh, that they would do pâtés out of pork liver. And lots of pork. Uh, it was the most consumed. But for people on the move, if you were going from one place to another, or if you were traveling, or if you were going on a voyage and you take, took your animals with you, uh, cattle and horses would be slaughtered along the way, and they would eat them. Why wouldn't they take pigs on a voyage or on the march? They're heavy and they don't move very fast. You, yeah, they're heavy, they don't move very fast, and yeah? Maybe because they consumed uh, either food or water that was necessary for them? Uh, yeah, whereas the sheep and the, and the cows could, uh, could survive on grass or hay, so it wouldn't be for the people. But you can't herd pigs. I mean, you really can't herd pigs. Uh, and, and so you couldn't herd them along the way uh, as you could cattle or horses. They ate horses, by the way. Horses uh, were commonly eaten until Christianity um, uh, took over uh, the Scandinavian culture uh, because the Catholic Church forbids the eating of horses, as does the Jewish uh, religion forbid the eating of horses. Um, and nevertheless, uh, horses are still a delicacy in France, and, and they're, they're eaten now, uh, commonly in France. Uh, if you go to the finest restaurants, you can get horse meat. But they were, um, uh, so they were commonly eaten by Scandinavian. The, the men usually slaughtered the animals, and the women cut them up and cooked them, unless there were no women, if the men were on a Viking expedition, or if they were on an exploration expedition, or they, if they were fishing or hunting, the men did their own cooking, or at the all thing where there were no women at the all thing, and we'll talk about the all thing later, which is a kind of parliament, um, uh, um, and or at the games. The games were only for the men. They would dry the meat, uh, kind of like beef jerky or horse jerky or or pork dried. Uh, and winter provided a natural freezer for all these foods, and so all you needed to do in the wintertime was put it in the storeroom that was unheated, and they would always have a storeroom that was unheated. But one of the interesting things that, that I couldn't find an explanation for anywhere that I looked was that meat was usually boiled and not roasted. They, they didn't roast their meat. Uh, in, in most of Northern Europe, they did, uh, people roasted meat, but, but not in Scandinavia. They usually boiled it, and they had huge kettles to boil the meat in. Um, as for the drinks, uh, beer was the most important, and they brewed the beer from barley and rye. They also made a fermented drink from honey and water, which is called mead. Has anybody ever had mead? Yeah, what, what, did you, what did you think of it? It was okay. So it's not like wine or beer, though. It's something completely different taste. Don't know how to describe it, really. Oh, I could describe it. It's yuck. <laughs> I don't like sweet things. I, I mean, I think it's really it's too sweet. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like mead, but um, that's okay. <laughs> They also drink something called Bior, a highly fermented fruit drink uh, that I, I guess it would be reminiscent of wine. You know how they make wine out of raspberries or strawberries or currants. Um, uh, I bet we could include currants with the fruits they ate as well. A currant is a kind of berry. It's not like a raisin, but it's, it's more like a berry. And, and a highly fermented fruit drink. And one of the uh, traditional holiday dishes to this day in Scandinavia is something called fruit soup. 
that you can make from either fresh or dried fruits, but they, they, it's kind of a cooked fruit and it's kind of syrupy and um, quite delicious. I, I liked it when, when I had it and, and uh, that's a holiday treat. And if, if they used it at Christmas, of course, they would have used dried fruits, except maybe the apples would keep in a storeroom as long as they didn't freeze. But this is probably how they figured out how to ferment things because if you, if you have your apples stored in the cold room and they freeze, then they'll ferment. <laughs> so and if you leave them in the sack. So that's probably how they learned how to do it. And so the fermented drinks. And they drank out of drinking horns. And I showed you these, uh, these golden horns. These are the golden horns discovered uh, in, in 1734. Uh, so that you can see these wonderful horns are, um, uh, are, are very intricately worked with fine pictures uh, along the sides. And here's a runic inscription on these horns. They're huge. Uh, they're, they're about this big. They're, they're just gigantic horns that, that, that they drank out of. And they would, um, they would drink it down all the way to the bottom or they would pass it around to everybody and everybody would drink out of the same horn. But, uh, and these are the horns. Here is the actual picture of them, the photograph that I took of them in Denmark. And you can see these wonderful uh, pictures on them. And here are the carvings, uh, the, the metal working on uh, the golden horn. Um, and we can see these same kinds of things that we saw in the rock carvings. This is probably a shaman uh, with that horned kind of helmet and these magic symbols in his hands. And here are hunters, and then we can see the animals that are that that he's hunting, and the fish, and the sun symbols in the sky. This is a reindeer. This looks like a wolf, doesn't it? The reindeer. These look like wolves to me, or maybe they're fur-bearing animals like a marten or a sable, or a mink. Here we have a hunter with a bow and arrow, and uh, apparently he has shot a deer. And this looks like a dog attacking it. These, uh, could you suppose this could be fur? Again, we have, this is obviously a god with three heads. And that might be a goat with a horn on it. fishes. This looks like a horse that he's hunting with. And that looks like a deer with its antlers. Looks like a squid. Now that looks like a satyr with a human body and an animal's, a human head and an animal's body. A two-headed horse. Clearly magical symbols here. So we can see the hunting going on in these uh, in, in these wonderful, this looks like a horse uh, again being led and he's got a, a spear or something here. Oh here we have, here we have a bird that, that two birds might be ducks or geese or chickens. Maybe those are our chickens. Okay, now the dress that people wore Wool was of the utmost importance. Why do you think wool would be so important to to, uh, to the Viking, to the Scandinavians? It was so darn hot all the time. <laughs> okay, the wool or the climate? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. What are the qualities of wool that make it so so advantageous to the northern lands? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it's somewhat water repellent if it's not treated and it's also warm. Yes, it has natural lanolin in it and so it's water repellent and it's, uh, and it's also very warm. It's sort of, uh, um, uh, someone, someone told me in class uh, last time when we were talking about this that, uh, that it wicks the, the, the moisture away from your body and, and still insulates and keeps you warm so that if you had a sweater on 
uh, uh, something like a sweater or a woolen garment and then you had a leather jacket over it I mean you would be just toasty warm even in the coldest weather and wool inside your gloves will keep your your hands warm and so the wool is really of utmost importance I have knitting and weaving down there certainly were looms uh, and then I found another book that said that um, that they didn't know how to knit and which really surprised me but and I'm not sure that's right that they didn't have the technique of knitting yet I think they had the technique of knitting by the time the Viking Age was over in 1050 but to this day I mean when you go to Ireland which was a Viking land in this in this time and they make those wonderful fishermen knit sweaters that are so warm um, I have a Norwegian sweater uh, that I got when I was in Denmark and um, uh, I'll wear it on the next if we have a cold day next week <laughs> but it is very warm it's much too warm for Houston I don't get to wear it very often and so I might have to take it off if, if it's too hot but it's wonderful folk art patterns that are Norwegian um, so they loomed all of this this wool clothing and men wore trousers and tunics uh, they would wear, wear they, we don't know if they wore underclothing or not. I kind of suspect they did, something like long underwear <laughs> underneath. Um, and they wore trousers, and then they wore a tunic that would be a long shirt-like garment. And then they would have a cloak that would be fastened with a brooch on, on the shoulder. Uh, women wore shifts. Um, that would sometimes be pleated of a very fine wool and then they would have an overdress fastened with brooches on the shoulders. Um, they used leather for shoes and ankle boots and taller boots and I showed you that sandal a while ago that I thought was a saddle. I read it wrong. But uh, they, they made their shoes and their ankle boots and their taller boots out of goat skins, goat leather. Uh, and they used furs for cloaks, which would be for very rich people to have a fur cloak, or they would use it as trimming. They also highly decorated their clothing with appliques and embroidery trims, and sometimes they would have imported silks and satins that would trim their clothing. They also naturally wore caps or headdresses, which would have kept their heads warm. And, and really, if you keep your head warm when you're out in the snow, that's one of the secrets to staying warm. And remember last week I told you the Swedish saying, there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. So clothing was very important to them. It was carefully designed. They would also, if they, if they didn't wear the cloak, they might wear a jacket um, uh, on a, a kind of uh, far um, Middle Eastern design, maybe learned from the Muslims, that would be fastened with a wide belt and a belt buckle around them. Uh, and uh, the books I looked at asked the questions of did they wear stockings, and my answer is probably they did wear stockings, but they wouldn't have been knit stockings if they didn't have knitting yet. This whole question of did they have knitting or not, um, very vexing to see if they had knitting. But here are some of their woven fabrics, so you can see this very finely woven uh, fabric from the Thorsberg find. It's got a border on it here and a border on it here of a different woven design, very tightly woven. Here's a kind of herringbone design of it. And um, here is a border design. So it's highly decorative, even though, even though it's woven um, uh, rather than knitted. And so very decorated. Here are pants. And these trousers of woven woolen cloth appear to go all the way over his feet, don't they? It looks like the feet are woven into these trousers. This is a bog find that was found buried in a bog. Um, that reminds me that, that one of our students came up to me at the break and suggested to me that one reason they might not have had pottery was because there wasn't any good clay in that region because there was so much organic material in the forested areas that the, that it was difficult to get the clay that wasn't contaminated with with organic material 
and so the clay was a very bad quality and and the pictures I showed you and and when I looked through all the books the pottery that I saw didn't seem to be fired and maybe that's because the the pottery was the the clay was of such bad quality and you need a much hotter fire to fire pottery than you do to um, um, smelt metal and and so perhaps that's why uh, the, the, the bog reminded me of that. The bog is full of organic material and that's what these fabrics were buried in. The bog preserved them in, in the water, in the organic material. Here is a woolen shirt or a blouse that might have been worn uh, as a kind of tunic. Um, and here is a woven border at the bottom of the shirt and the pattern of the body of the shirt. Again, very patterned, very decorative. Everything they do is very decorative. And here is an example of the kind of outfit that the man would have. And he, these trousers, the, the ones we saw from the bog, were, looked like they were very fitted. This is the type that they wore in Russia and, and possibly influenced by the Muslim culture. They're more like pantaloons that are very full and gathered uh, under the knee, um, uh, gathered together. And then here is the tunic that you can see with a belt. This is a tied belt and a jacket. This, this man has a jacket on um, with fur trimming on it on the around the edges and on the sleeves. Here is a woman's outfit and uh, this is the pleated shift that she would wear underneath and then over it she would wear this kind of, um, it almost looks like a kind of jumper and, and I'll show you another picture. It's fastened with uh, straps on it over here and then here is the cloak. Uh, that goes over here. It looks like she's got a blanket or something as well and she's got her tools, her knife and her scissors uh, attached here and, and a cap on her head. Here's another woman's dress without the cloak and you can see these straps that hold this overdress over the shift and often she would have these brooches that would be pins that would hold the straps together and then she would have a brooch at the neck on her shift as well. Here is a fancier woman's dress, a bright red and then she has a shawl. It looks like it's trimmed in fur over here. I should have taken the whole picture there. And this is what the brooches look like. This isn't a great picture but I wanted to show you this uh, triangular brooch which is so common, uh, commonly used it as the brooches and then these these almost half moon shaped brooches uh, look just like the ones we saw fastening her dress. Uh, these two brooches at, at the top on the straps and here are some gold ones that are utterly gorgeous. Any of us would love to have those in our jewelry box. Aren't they beautiful and they're so ornate and, and those might have been used to fasten the cloak on a man's uh, outfit or a woman's. And then here is a lovely gold bracelet of course. Here is some of the jewelry that might have been worn. Um, I'm not sure it, whether these are earrings or pins. Uh, I, uh, it's hard to tell which are the earrings. Um, unfortunately I can't read Danish so I couldn't read the little sign that said what they were. But here are some beautiful jewels that are set in these. I think these are the little pins that they might put at the neck uh, of uh, the dress. And here's, here's a necklace that they might wear. The houses were uh, farmhouses and remember, remember I told you that they lived kind of in isolation. They might live in an extended family, but there was, but there was such a, a, a paucity of cultivable land, meadows that could be cultivated, and flatlands, except in Denmark. I mean, in Denmark they cultivated a lot more grain and land. But usually the farmhouses were very isolated. 
and they would they would be long houses. And here are some of the names that that of the uh, Danish uh, long houses or halls or houses that people would live in. Uh, the uh, Stofa is a hall. The elders is the heated room, probably a separate building uh, where where they would have heat. Um, but that seems to be separate also from the building where the women cooked, the room in which the women prepare food. Uh, let me attempt to pronounce this. The, the bur that er honor hafa matretho. Okay. Uh, the room in which the women prepare food. The utabur is an outside storage room. The matbur is a pantry. The sky burr is a room where they keep curds. The south burr is a southern room where, obviously, with a southern exposure that would get more sun. And did they use the sun's heat? And did they use that for fermentation? Those are the guesses for what the south burr might be used for. The south burr is the saddle room. And the gerber is the war room or the gear room would be Gerwiber is the war room or the gear room where they would keep um, uh, weapons and they would keep um, armor and everything they would need to go to war. Obviously a long house that would have all of these outbuildings attached to it or storage buildings and also barns because they would have barns for their animals. That would be a very huge and rich farmstead. Um, many of the smaller ones would only have the one longhouse and, and, and they would have to make do with everything in that one longhouse. So this would be in the farmhouse. And I have some pictures. Um, this is a modern farmhouse, but it makes me think of, um, I, I took this outside of Trelleborg, and it makes me think of an isolated farmhouse that might have been how it would have sat in the countryside in Denmark. But here is a model of what the farmhouse might have looked like. And here we have two main longhouses and some outbuildings that might be barns or pantries um, attached to it uh, with the different, I'm, I'm not sure what those are. This looks like a, a stack of logs or something out by the side of it. So this is a model of what the farmhouse would have looked like. And here is a model of a, of a farm. Um, this is a long house and uh, it doesn't really have any outbuildings but it has all the people working around it. Here, here is a wagon with the farmers working and of course the fishermen along here and all the people are working with the animals, felling trees, cutting logs. These, are, these look like skin boats. And here is another view of the house from, from this angle, where you can see the fishermen coming with their catch and the, the very small house uh, that they're attached to, that they're, they're working for here. OK, on smaller farms, the pantry stored all kinds of food. On larger farms, they would have special storerooms for each of the different kinds of food, for meat and curds and cheese. Um, and, uh, but on smaller farms, they would only have one building for all the food, which would be a pantry. And it wouldn't be heated, of course. So uh, again, we have that natural storage in, in the natural freezer just in the room. The storage rooms or houses were built on high, dry sites. And the storage room was locked. It was the only building on the farm that would have a padlock on it. And the housewife had the key. It was the only locked place on the farm. We would also have soft, uh, a sofa house, which would be a sheep burn, uh, a sheep barn, and a, a gata house, which would be a goat barn. Buildings could be built of timber or turf st with straw or grass roofs. And so you would, you would find these um, sort of thatched roofs that still exist all over Denmark. Um, 
they're also, we have the farmsteads being pretty much in isolation all over Scandinavia, but there were also towns or trading posts. And they were quite small, but they would be a collection of houses smaller than the longhouse would be, but a collection of houses gathered together in a strategic place at the confluence of rivers or the confluence of rivers and oceans and trade routes. And so there they would found a town for trading. Uh, and it would start out as a trading post and it would grow larger and larger into a town. You would have a collection of houses and these were usually built on the, on the coast and they were usually built in a triangular shape one side of the town was a river or stream or coastline and around the outside would be a sort of earthworks that would be built up higher than a house would be that would be a sort of embankment that would be uh, to protect them from invasion or attack. The town life included merchants and craftsmen of all types, and they weren't based on agriculture at all or the herding of animals. I mean, everything was imported for their food, but the merchants and craftsmen would be carrying out trade or the manufacture of making of goods of all kinds to trade. Okay, here is a thatched roof in Denmark. They still exist today and they still use them. Uh, what would be the advantages of a thatched roof? What can you think of that would be an advantage? What? Uh, it's insulated and it's easy to repair. Good. Okay. It's cheap. It's wonderful insulation. It keeps them <coughs> very warm and keeps the fire inside the house. And it's very easy to re repair. Uh, it wouldn't be expensive like this tile roof would be over here. Okay, <clears throat> Hedeby was one of the most important and famous of the towns. And we're going to use that as an example to sort of describe what the Viking towns were like. On the north and west and south, it was protected by a semicircular rampart that first was, uh, when, they f when it was first built, it was just a piling up of earth in a kind of earthworks in a circle around the town. The east, however, was bounded by the waters of Hadaby Noor, and so it's a, it, it goes, uh, it's built on the side of a bay. Uh, later on, there was added to the top of the rampart a stockade of timber and a ditch around the outside. And by the time Hedeby was at its prime, uh, the stockade on top of the rampart was 30 feet tall with a deep moat around the outside. So the ditch sort of evolved into a moat. It got bigger and deeper, and it was a moat around the edge, a very defensible. <clears throat> there were three gateways or tunnels, and tunnel only has one S, okay? <laughs> there were three gateways or tunnels in the side of the wall, one on the south, one on the north, and one on the on the west and into these tunnels or gateways um, they were about six feet wide they were wedge shaped I'm going to show you a picture of one in a moment and they were planked on the side so they would be cut in a kind of wedge like uh, narrowing uh, um, wide at the top narrowing down at the bottom and then they would be planked with planks along the side of it and then the bottom of it which is a road going into the town would be paved with stones so the wagons uh, could go along it um, Hedeby, the, the enclosure of Hedeby enclosed 60 acres which is a very large uh, area of town um, there was a slip for shipbuilding or repairs uh, so that there was a, a place where the ships could pull up and, or, or they could be launched or they could be repaired. And the, um, the earthworks were made so that there was flood protection and places for vessels or ships to tie up along the waterfront of it. Inside the town there were dwelling houses and workshops and storehouses and barns and stables. Um, it was very clear 
that there were two good streets that kind of crossed in the middle of it. And you can discern a craftsman's quarter where craftsmen, metal workers and carpenters and uh, people who did, who, who made uh, various kinds of implements had their businesses and carried out a kind of manufacture in the town. Uh, this is a model of a town and you can see uh, the buildings. Um, this is this is a model of a town. It's 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 not like Hedeby. It doesn't have a, a waterway that I can see in this town, but it has the long houses and it has the the um, outbuildings that would be either small houses or they would be barns or they would be storehouses, and there are fences around all of them. It, they they had fences around their houses, which is kind of interesting, I think. Um, so this is a model, and, and here we have a sort of meadow in the middle of the, of the town where the animals could graze. Um, and I don't see the waterfront in this particular town. They don't. This one is not built on a waterfront. This is it not exactly like Hedeby either. This is a ring fort, and and I have this model of a ring fort. It's it's a military installation, but it's built along the same kinds of lines of a town. And, and so I'm showing this to you because I'm going to show you some photographs of it in a minute. This is Trelleborg in Denmark. And this is the earthwork around it. It's, it's a tall rampart of earth. Here are the long houses, but they're, these are built in a military formation with um, outhouses or outbuildings there. And here are smaller buildings, or these might be ships that are upside down um, over here outside the ring fort. Um, this model doesn't show the openings in it, but there are openings in it on all four sides. They're, they're almost very regular openings where you go in and out of the, of the ring fort. I'll show you some photographs in a moment. The houses ranged from 22 by 54 feet, which is, which is kind of a sizable house, uh, down to about 10 by 10 feet, which would be quite a small house. Uh, they, some of them were made of timber. Some of them were made of wattle and daub. Do you all know what wattle and daub is? What's wattle and daub? Something like mud and sticks. Mud and, and sticks, like yeah. Mud and, mud and sticks are straw or or the modern version of it is stucco. Uh, stucco is actually wattle and daub. <laughs> and uh, so they were made like that in a kind of stucco. Uh, they were frame built with wooden, um, wooden timbers or they would have reed and thatch roofs. Uh, the doors were quite low. They're surprisingly low and in fact they still are in Denmark today. I, 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 in going into some of the older uh, historic buildings in, in Copenhagen, um, I recall the doors were quite, were quite low. Often the houses had sunken floors. What would be the advantage of having sunken floors? What do you think? Escape. Escape? How could you? How does a sunken floor help you escape? Oh, sorry, I thought you said sunken floors. No, sunken floors. Sunken floors. You use for insulation in the cold winters. You dig down to the floor. You don't bring your building very high. Excellent. Yes, because the building the the building is lower, and so actually, when when you do the sunken floor. Uh, what they do is just sink the middle of the floor and so what is left is a, is a kind of natural bench all around the outside that could be used for beds. Uh, maybe I can draw a little picture of it so that if you have the long house like this, only this part of the floor would be sunken and the fire would be in the middle here and this would be like a bench or beds that people could sleep on. Uh, so this would not be sunken, but it would be for warmth. It would help. It would help with insulation. It would help to keep it warmer with the ceiling being lower. Um, so good answer. 
many houses were fenced in the city and we saw in our diagram before that they had fences around them and uh, many people kept dogs and cats in their houses in the city. Why do you think they would do that? Why would they, why would people keep dogs and cats? Yeah? Keep away the vermin? <laughs> Good, yeah. Yeah, cats are, are wonderful for catching mice and rats, and so, and so everybody in Europe had cats everywhere, but they were outside cats uh, to catch the rats and the vermin of all kinds, and the mice uh, who get into the grain storage and uh, into the food storage. Uh, dogs could be guard dogs to guard against theft uh, and, and to generally guard the property, but, but they also special, ra uh, special dogs like terriers are bred to catch rats. Rats are quite big. In fact, especially the Norwegian rats are very big, and so you would need the dogs to catch the rats. The craftsmen would have included a blacksmith, a goldsmith, a carpenter, shipwrights to work on the ships and repair them, potters, weavers, jewelers, bone and horn workers, and perhaps a minter to mint coins. So you would have a sizable craftsman's quarter of the town in, in, a, in a fairly large town like Hedeby, uh, manufacturing all of these, all of these things. Uh, pots seem to have been mass produced along with bronze and iron. So here is a mention of the pots that were produced. Um, they also began to manufacture like what we would think of as crockery or plates and cups and bowls uh, later on in the Viking Age. The goods that they traded in a city like Hedeby would be ceramics and glassware. Uh, luxury goods coming from Europe or from the Mediterranean, Frankish swords uh, because France was famous for these swords and here they would import the swords partially finished, only the blades and then they would then they would finish, um, they would refine the edges of the blade and add the hilt uh, in, in the town. Basalt millstones to mill the grain soapstone pots and dishes, and soapstone is a kind of stone um, which would be more durable than pottery dishes. And these are all the imported goods, and of course slaves, and, and um, the Vikings were really big in the slave trades. Uh, they traded slaves from everywhere. They captured black men in Africa and Spain and brought them to Ireland. They captured Irish slaves and brought them to the Muslim countries and uh, they carried on a huge slave trade. They captured Slavs in the Sla Slavic lands and that's where the word slave actually came from uh, uh, and sold them to anyone who wanted to buy them. Uh, but I always ask the question, who was there to buy these slaves, which is a very interesting question. Who was going to buy the slaves? Um, the market for slaves was Spain, which was a Muslim country, and uh, the Muslims still allow slaves. And in fact, we read in the newspapers every now and then where a, a Muslim princess comes to this country and her servant escapes and says she was being kept a slave. Um, that's happened three or four times. Um, yeah, the Muslims, I, I mean, they kind of put it under the count uh, under the cover, they, they keep it quiet, but slavery is permitted in, in Muslim countries. Um, and uh, in the Muslim countries themselves in the East were uh, be a huge market for slaves. Um, the Viking countries themselves, before they were Christianized, were a huge market for slaves. Um, Christianity forbids slavery. And so Europe itself didn't have a lot didn't have a lot of slavery in the European countries, and slavery slowly died out in Scandinavia after it was Christianized. Uh, so that that was the original market for the slaves. Um, furs, of course, furs would be a Viking product that would be in demand all over the world and everywhere because the northern lands were very rich in fur-bearing animals, just 
enormously rich and Viking furs were prized in every area of the world. Uh, Europe itself and even the Mediterranean and, and the Eastern lands um, in, uh, well, the Muslim lands in Turkey, for example, and, and in what we think of as the Holy Land, uh, the modern day Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, they get quite cold in the winter. And so furs were in demand in that area. Uh, something I didn't put on this list is amber. Amber was in enormous demand. It is, do you all know what amber is? It is um, the sap of pine trees that hardens into stone and over the centuries it's pressed into really hard stone. And uh, the, the most um, wonderful amber has insects trapped in it or even small animals. And, and so uh, it makes a very beautiful um, golden uh, uh, gem-like hard stone. And of course the golden color would, would catch the sun, make you think of the sun, which is one reason that it was so desired. But if you treat it with heat, it turns different colors, like it'll turn green and, and, and different colors treated the right way. So it's a very fine uh, stone and also jewelry. And, and the Vikings made gorgeous jewelry. I showed you some of the jewelry before. Luxury garments and fabrics would come in from the Middle East and some of the very rich uh, aristocratic families had silk clothing that, that was imported on the Silk Road from the Muslim countries. Um, and uh, so luxury garments were, um, uh, were a major item of trade that came into the Scandinavian uh, countries. Swedish Burka was similar to Hedeby as a huge city of trade and Vikings founded these cities all over the Viking world. I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, I'm going to show you a map with all the cities that they founded. Well, here are some pictures of, now this is a foundation. This is inside Trelleborg, again, the foundation of an outbuilding or a house. Uh, or a storeroom or a barn, we don't know what it is, but, but we see this perfectly square foundation of some of the land, uh, some of the houses that we saw before. And, and this, again, these pictures I took in, in, in March. It was still cold. This is inside the fort at Trelleborg, and this is the outline of the long house as it would have been uh, the long, uh, the, the outline of the foundation where it would have been, and here is a, an attached building that might be a storehouse or a barn. And here you can see the earthworks, and this is huge. I mean, it's very, very large, and this earthwork is maybe about 30 feet tall. I mean, it's quite tall. It's very, it's very um, massive, this piling up of earth. Um, here you can see this is still inside the earthwork. You can see the earthwork here. And this is a model of one of these long houses. It has a kind of porch around the outside with these posts, which is kind of interesting. But what does it look like to you? I mean, how would you describe that? And here are the foundations of other of those long houses that would have been there. What does it look like to you? Well, it makes me think of an upside down ship. <laughs> look, look how these foundations curve out. They almost have the shape of a ship and, and this building. You can see the foundations curved out and it looks kind of like an upside down ship, I think. Um, maybe you can see the curving walls there, but maybe this just this this is a close up of it. Doesn't it look like an upside down ship kind of? Which is an interesting, and, and the roof is thatched also. This this is not a chimney; it's simply a hole in the roof to let 
the, the smoke out because you build your fire in the middle of the room. The chimney was invented in the 13th century in Europe and so they didn't have chimneys yet but they just had this hole in the roof for the smoke to go out. And they have something that later on is going to become very prominent on um, Scandinavian buildings uh, and that is a kind of ornament on the edge of the roof and later on they'll put animals maybe to scare away the, the spirits or, or um, the bad luck or any harm that might come to it. And so you can see um, this is a model of course that, that's built in Trelleborg. Here is the door to go into it. Notice that it doesn't have any windows. Why do you think it doesn't have any windows? Yep. It would uh, allow the warmth to escape out into the outside air. Right, you wouldn't want the warmth to escape to the outside air so you don't have any windows and you can close a door uh, that, but they didn't think, they didn't really think to make windows. Uh, but the warmth is escaping out the chimney with the smoke. <laughs> That's one problem. Okay, now here is the inside of the longhouse and, and uh, um, I was quite pleased that these um, pictures came out all right. Here you can see these kind of bench-like earthen um, banks along each side that, that could be beds or they could be seating areas. Uh, you could use them as tables. Here is the fire that's made in the very middle of, of the hut. And, and since this is a military longhouse, there's not beautiful furnishings in it. We have very simple chairs and sort of stumps to sit on, a log to sit on. And so there may be a lot of simplicity, but you can sort of see the walls and the rafters up here. They're very dark inside, very dark inside. No wonder people have problems with depression and suicide. I mean, so you would, you would know, I mean, people would want to go outside a lot. And so they, they wouldn't want to stay inside all the time in, in, in sort of a dark room like that. But they would spend their winters, uh, surely in the summertime they would be outside, but they would be inside some in the, in, in the winter, but they would play games, and they would play word games, and they would play chess, um, uh, games of military, chess is a game of military strategy, of course, that, that they would um, do. Um, they also would go outside in the winter time because they wouldn't want to stay in. Um, actually, the Scandinavians invented skis and snowshoes and ice skates, and so they participated in activities like that um, as they went outside in the winter time. Here's another picture of the inside uh, um, from another angle so that you can see the rafters a little bit better, the, the timber rafters as they're made, and the stools around the fire and, and the banks. Okay. Here's a view from inside Trelleborg so that you can see the earthen works. Um, This is actually taken from the top of the earthworks. And, and you see the foundations of the houses. Uh, this is the view outside where those boat-shaped smaller houses were outside. Um, outside the palisade. This I think is one of those tunnels that go inside and out where they have those four entrances, one on each side, and here is the entrance. Um, this one is has stones on the side of it um, rather than planking, and it, I've, I've taken it from the outside looking into the fort fortress at Trelleborg. And, um, a paved road that goes in. And as a town, the kind of implements that would be there, uh, of course, that would be common to the use would be a scale, 
so that you could weigh goods that you might want to trade? What, what kind of goods might you weigh in scales of this kind? Gold, yeah, you would weigh, you, you might weigh gold. You know, uh, you want to use your microphone? Oh, <laughs> okay. Grain. Yeah, you might weigh grain, although, although you might have a bigger scale than that to weigh grain on. Um, uh, but probably more gold or more precious things uh, would be weighed on a scale of that size. And here, here are the weights up here. Uh, that would be used to to um, see what kind of um, uh, you know you'd put the weights in one and then and then the grain or the gold or the amber or whatever you were, were weighing in the other one and of course this would be very important to a trading town of merchants um, here are some other uh, artifacts that might have been used uh, by, um, made by the, uh, the craftsmen in the town. Here is a spiral silver ring used probably as money. Okay, and here is a box in which there was a scale, ten beads and two ornaments of silver inside this box. Here's a hook, and here's a weight uh, again. Now, sometimes the Vikings would use coins for money, but other times they would just chop up metals of various kinds of gold and silver, uh, and they would weigh it in the scale. Uh, and, and this is how a lot of the um, art and artifacts of Europe ended up sometimes. Uh, it, if they didn't have coins, which they knew the value of, they would just take gold and silver and just chop it up, and it was called, um, oh, it, uh, it was called, uh, oh, now I can't remember what it's called, hack, hack silver. And, and so it was just, they would just take the weight of it, you know, and so they destroyed a lot of things. They could be very destructive. Um, and here would be the kind of coins that they might, um, f that you might find early in the Viking period. These are from, these are Frankish coins. This is from uh, the Pepin, Pepin king of Aquitaine. And this is very early um, in the 800s. And this one is of the 9th century, a, a silver coin, uh, which might have been Louis Le Debonair. I'm not sure if that's as if that's a correct name, but but one of the Louis. Um, okay, from the time of uh, one of the sons of Char Charlemagne or grandsons of Charlemagne. So th these would be the kinds of coins, and here we can see <coughs> the. Um, the towns that were founded that would have been like Hedeby. Hedeby itself is right here. Here's Hedeby. But some of the other famous towns were Reba in Denmark, Weeborg and Alborg in Denmark, Lund in Sweden, Volen at the head of, uh, well, it's actually where Danzig is today. Here is Trusso, a very important town. This is Novgorod, which, which grew into a duchy of Novgorod and eventually Russia. Kiev, of course, uh, at a very important part in the Dnieper River here. Um, Dor Dorostad is a very famous and important town, again, trading town on the coast. York in England was one of the most important towns. And every town in Ireland, I've, I have put Dublin on this coast and Limerick on this coast, but, but Waterford is down here. And Ireland had no towns before the Vikings came. They founded all the towns. 
and they were very like Hedeby, uh, which we just described. Another important town would have been Rouen, which was a pre-existing city. Rouen goes all the way back to Roman times in Normandy, but it developed into a, a major uh, port and trading area. And then later on, uh, the Vikings founded another town uh, uh, in Normandy. See if I can locate it appropriately here. It's right about here, and it's the city of Caen, which was actually a Viking foundation uh, of Caen. And Caen was at such a, a major point. So it was at the confluence of two rivers, where two rivers flowed together, and where the trade routes from Spain and England and France came together at that particular spot. Roman roads crossed at that point. It was a perfect place for a trading town, and the Normans founded a town there when they were not very removed from their Viking days. And, and so that gives you an example uh, of where they would found a town at, at a perfect trade route. And this is true also of Lund, Burka is a major trading post that goes into the North Sea with Finland and um, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, the Viking trade in here, all of the North Sea trade routes that go into here at Burka. And um, let's see if I can read that. Can't read it. Skuttingsal, Trondheim becomes a major trading trading post in that area too, so that we can see where these trading areas um, came together. So now we've we've looked at uh, we've looked at the material culture of the Vikings, the kind of environment they lived in. We've looked at the um, uh, we've looked at the technology that they had. Uh, we, ha we haven't gone into great detail about the technology. We've just sort of taken an overview of it. Uh, we've looked at um, the food and clothing that they had and the houses they lived in and the towns they lived in or, or the towns that they founded as trading posts. Um, what I've tried to do tonight is to create for you a, a feel for the visual and material world of the Vikings as they lived in it. Um, any, any questions or comments? We still have a few minutes left over. Anything that occurs to you that we haven't covered yet? <laughs> All your questions are answered, right? <laughs> well, I have a question. Okay, yeah. We were talking about the artworks. Were the artisans professional? Was that all that they did, or was that just in the towns? If you were out in the, you know, in a farmstead, would mm -hmm. one of the farmers perform those functions as a blacksmith, or or would they have to wait for an artisan to come around to them? Oh, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, in the larger farms, there would have been a blacksmith sort of in residence, somebody who, who would do that sort of thing. I imagine that um, that they, they wouldn't have the specialized artisans like the wood carvers and the craftsmen who did the wood carving uh, on every, every farm. Even the large ones wouldn't be there. Um, uh, but blacksmithing was so important that they would have blacksmiths on every farm. Uh, probably, I doubt that they had a potter on every farm. Uh, I doubt that they had, uh, um, I doubt that they had gold, I mean, they wouldn't have had goldsmiths on every farm. I mean, the goldsmiths would have been more like artists uh, than artisans even. Uh, not like artists are today. That's a wrong thing to think about uh, uh, creative beings because they, they're, they're, they're useful. I mean, you know, they're, they're practical and, and they think of things as being useful and practical and yet they were very specialized and too specialized to be on every farm. They would only be in the towns. 
Well, that was a good question. Yeah. A any other any other questions that you might have? I thought about going home uh, this afternoon. I, I usually come in early in the morning on Tuesdays and kind of work all day. I, I thought about going home because I wanted to get my Scandinavian cookbook and give you some ideas about recipes. Um, uh, what do you think of when you think of Scandinavian food that you eat? We've co we covered kind of the basics, but we didn't talk about any like Scandinavian recipes. Swedish meatballs, yes, and exactly they would eat Swedish meatballs. I mean that would be something that would be that would be part of what they ate, they ate, and it would be in a kind of milk sauce and sort of creamy sauce. Yeah. Uh, we eat a lot of yogurt that you know of. That seemed like all, all they were eating when I was there was yogurt, yogurt, yogurt. I don't think they ate yogurt. No, they were well, more. I mean, no, I know they didn't know how, to, how to make it back then, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Modern. Well, the modern Americans eat yogurt a lot too, but I, th I think that's a modern thing. Yeah, but like, <laughs> I mean, the cereal, they didn't put milk on it, they just poured yogurt all over it, you know? Yeah. Well, I think in the old Viking days, they would have they would have put water on it and sort of mushed it up into a mushy kind of groats thing. It sounds kind of awful to me, but. Well, what other recipes can you think of as traditional kinds of um, Scandinavian food? They wouldn't have had any potatoes, remember, because that's a New World product. Turnips, delicious turnips, would have been big with them. They have had like borscht, they, like those sort of Russian delicacies. I mean, since they are already over in like Novgorod. Yes. They would have had beets. They would have had sugar be They would have had beets that they could make sugar out of, or they would have had beets that they would eat as a vegetable, or they would pickle the beets just like they pickle the herring. Uh, uh, pickled beets are, um, in, in fact, a, a very good Scandinavian food. Any others that you can think of? Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned boiling meats. So what about stews? Yeah, they, obviously that they would they would boil the meats into a kind of stew. I mean, I don't know how else they they would have fixed the meat, except that when I was there, they they had a lot of like liver pate. They they served a lot of liver pate. It was very popular. Um, how about the cabbage? How do you think they cooked the cabbage? Boiled it. Yeah, they boiled it. How about, yeah. Is there any reason why they didn't grill the meat ever? There's, there's got to be a reason, but it's a fa in all the books I looked in when I was trying to look this up, they might grill the meat in an emergency if they didn't have a pot to boil it in. But it, their preference was to boil the meat. One possibility on boiling the meat is that it would boil off the fats a lot better than grilling the meat because uh, you don't if you boil the meat you get a healthier meat because it put you can boil out the fat and pour off the fat and still have the lean, have what lean meat is left true but I think they would have eaten the fat because it's nourishing because um, uh, people people who are poor who don't have a lot of resources would eat everything they would eat the fat but Boiling it makes it much more tender, doesn't it? If you roast it, then it won't be as tender. But if you boil it, it makes it very tender. Did, did you have a comment? Yeah. Did they have ovens? They, yes, they had ovens. Of course they would, but, but it would be more like a heated rock. I mean, they wouldn't, Danish pastry is not something they ate. Uh, <laughs> flat bread and they might do the fruit that's why they sort of boiled the fruit they seem to boil everything they boiled the fruit into a, a pasty kind of syrupy thing that was called fruit soup um, and and uh, the cabbage is sort of the same way did, did you have a question yeah. you I was I mean, thinking about what the gentleman said about boiling off the fat I mean the other possibility I mean 
yeah, would get the fat out of the out of the meat, but you could also then reuse the fat to, you know, make candles or to protect yeah. like leather goods and whatnot. So I mean, maybe it was sort of a recycling necessity. And the other thing I was thinking about is it pr you probably don't need a huge fire in order to boil meat. So it might be safer when you're going on a ship voyage if for some reason you were carrying meat and needed to cook it. Good point. Although somehow I imagine them taking their smoked salmon on the, uh, on the ships with them and their dried herring and their, uh, and their lutefisk <laughs> on the ships with them because, the, because the, or they would, you would think they would catch fresh fish. Um, they also would have gathered salad greens. They would have gathered watercress and fresh spinach and greens in the summertime, but they wouldn't have them in the wintertime. And so it would be very important to, to, to store their fruits and to dry their fruits to have the proper uh, vegetables, uh, the uh, proper vitamins in, in the wintertime. Well, what about sauerkraut? Sauerkraut? Is, is a very Viking thing. Also, uh, one of Libby's favorite dishes is uh, red cabbage and apples uh, with, with a sweetener in it. And does it have spices in it, Libby? It has vinegar, and you can use spice-infused vinegar, but yeah. the recipe I have is just, it's grandma's recipe. It's vinegar uh -huh. and sugar, but they could have used honey or sugar beets, whatever you said. Yeah. Um, red cabbage and apples and you just cook it forever and the apples kind of melt into the cabbage and make it sweet it's kind of sweet and sour yeah it's very good but it's not like sauerkraut it's not that sour <laughs> <laughs> but sauerkraut is very good with pork actually so so I mean they had some sort of gourmet trees but I think you're absolutely right that they you need a, a, a smaller fire to to build to to boil uh, something than you do to roast it. Yeah, come in. Also, <clears throat> smoke from a wood fire is much cleaner than a greasy smoke from cooking meat. <gasps> Good point. In the longhouse, in the middle of winter, you would not want to have the, the fat burning off the roasted meat, and, and so boiling it would make, make it much better. Okay, we're being signaled that our time is almost up. Good discussion tonight, lots of good participation. Next week, we're going to look at uh, Viking society and how the Vikings organized their communities, how they lived, how they thought of themselves, what kind of games they played, how they spent their leisure time, their sports, and all those good things. So we'll see you all next week.